Draft Science video uh, response to a holiday comment. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, well, I'll read it and I'll just do the. Uh, I think I can. I think I can illustrate the problem. Uh, why you? I don't like that much stress over Huygens Fresnel principle. Fresnel. Fresnel. Uh, it's a classic theory, not a quantum theory. Well, I don't agree, um, fundamentally. I mean, Huygens was obsessed with wave theory. Um, he was one of the first quantum theory type advocates of this whole, it's a wave, it's not a particle thing. And, um, clearly, the, the contrivance of Huygens is merely to somehow push the single slit experiment into the double slit experiment, to somehow make the two mathematically the same. And that's all Huygens does. If you use Huygens in the double slit experiment, you'll end up with four photons interfering with each other, not two. So it's not a principle, because it's not applied consistently to all circumstances that are alike. All slits aren't alike, so therefore it can't be called a principle, because obviously the only time they apply it is when there's a single slit and they need to create a second photon. All right. Um, QM has wave states as super superposition states. Well, I don't. I don't really care. the The point is, is that it's this idea of something being in more than one place at once, which is silly, in my opinion, just grotesquely silly. No substantial evidence that anything ever does that. So why have a model that isn't correct? End of. I don't know what that means. A vector space, if you like, as I've made videos about. Well, again, a vector space doesn't mean anything if you don't regain the momentum that exists now in bent space. So I'm just saying that having a vector space idea or just making a huge field out of all of reality and assigning all locations to a plus minus vector in three dimensions is fine, sort of. But you have to acknowledge where that momentum came from. And there's the original quanta, or what gave it momentum. And that it all has, there's no such thing as a neutral space, theoretically. There's just one being balanced by equal um, agitation. So there's no such thing as a non agitated state, there's a space. There's just spaces where there is a balance of force rather than an imbalance. Uh, <clears throat> it is philosophically untenable. Um, well, again, it says you. Um, I'm saying quite obviously it's quite philosophically tenable if you just accept the fact that the original universe is made of quanta, not matter. Uh, but no QM physicist is advocating Huygens. Well, I, again, I'm just going based on every single documentary produced describing the two slit experiment and the single slit experiment especially they all use Huygens you can go to whatever the Microsoft you know the guy financed by Micro, uh, Khan Academy he uses Huygens um, Huygens is always used to mathematically describe the single slit experiment it's the only way they can make the experiment mathematical it's the only way they can do quantum mechanics on the single slit experiment is to Huygens it because obviously on its face. There's nothing making the second photon. There's no second opening to create a second photon. So they have to contrive one. I mean, I've made this point over and over again, and I just think it's kind of bogus to sit there and keep bringing it up like I didn't bring it. I haven't stated this over and over. So, yeah, I mean, bullshit. So anyway, I shall draw and illustrate, hopefully. So, we have two things. And then we have the idea of the double. Yeah, we'll do the double over here. And, uh, well, I should have made that bigger. Okay, never mind that. <laughs> yeah, press that out. Yes. Um, but I, I just gotta need to make the openings bigger for the illustration purposes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll use a different color and everything should be fine. So let's say this was uh, a single slit. What I would argue is taking place is there are these field lines that everything um, creates because everything has some kind of um, charge property in the sense that everything has 
protons and neutrons and electrons in it, and that creates a uh, uh, a inverse squared, uh, you know, <laughs> in, uh, relationship. Uh, but, you know, the, the energy doesn't go away; it just weakens as it goes further away, and that kind of thing. But this is the idea that you would have um, these these bends um, in the field energy. So it's straighter here in the middle, and it's more angular on the sides. And uh, I'll get to the angular part in another drawing, but yes, I'll, I'll try, attempt to illustrate <coughs> what these, these lines really represent. They're really not curved lines, they're really um, ge geometry, um, you know, polygonic kind of stuff that magnets would do. So anyway, so in the double slit, the differences, so you have, see this, this idea that the two converge and there's, the, that's all it is. Well, in the double slit, you've just changed the relationship in the sense that you've, you've, you're creating this, um, the second object that's going to create these lines. And <clears throat> so instead of having just these field lines come into each other and meet and go straight, you have this circumstance where both sides are doing that. Um, and this, this single impediment, it could be a very small impediment, it doesn't matter how big it is, it will automatically create this circumstance where it's going to create this thing in the middle that has field lines. And that's different than this, quite obviously. You can see the difference. And that's really what's taking place. So let's talk about what's happening on these field lines. And what I would argue <coughs> is that these are you can't, even in a vacuum, electrons still exist. You can't pull them out because the whole point of electrons is they don't like each other. And so they sort of spread out uh, by consequence of that. Um, it's not that they don't like each other. They absorb each other's radiation, which means they absorb the momentum the other electron is exuding in the same polarization as them. Um, and that's, you know, causing this displacement. So I guess the first thing to understand is um, the back and forth ideas. Um, so an electron would be little electron, little bits, little quanta. They're not moving in circles. They're just moving back and forth. And this, this, you know, this star would have three dimensions. So it would end up being a sphere of stuff going back and forth. So the field energy is coming in. Um, and it's reflecting off of it. So the field energy comes in, the, anything coming at, at it hits, goes back the other way, hits, comes back the other way, hits, and that this density <laughs> is the same density, and that's why the electron is the size it is, is that it can only be this the same density as the field energy itself, um, arrow for arrow kind of an idea and that the only way the electron could get bigger is there would have to be fewer of these little green things to knock it back in. So if you had fewer greens, then these blues could go bigger. But they have to be this size because of the amount of pressure that comes into them. And so that's basically what's holding it together. <clears throat> so, but these represent the vectors of direction. And these, these arrows can be traveling in different orientations, I would assume, uh, not just through the center, but there could be ones that are going back and forth this way. Well, I should have done that in blue, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and um, uh, so different lengths of arrow could also be in here um, and such, I think. Uh, they're not different lengths. They're in different positions. So, so, so it's not like it's a perfect circle. So I guess the point to illustrate would be is that they can be quite eccentric to each other at any one point. They can be, this one can be going back and forth this way, this one's going back and forth this way. So they're the same length, but they're moving in. So, so this circle obviously wouldn't be a round circle for that exact moment. But exactly some other moment, it'll be exactly the other side. So every moment it's changing, a, you can have a funkier shape, but the end result is that over a period of time, it'll end up being a sphere. Uh, it'll average out to a circle. 
and that something that gets too far out of this probabilistic range, whatever this number would be, something that gets too far out of the, the, the bubble of acceptable would end up free. So this would end up escaping. Um, if it goes too, if this arrow comes too far off of this arrow, if it, if it loses the center of gravity, so to speak, connection to the center of gravity, you could almost argue, then it will escape um, and no longer be part of the electron. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, the polarization will escape and it will be replaced by foreign bits, if that's all there are, and the foreign bits will be the green to illustrate. So anyway, uh, so that, that's the nature of the electron. So the, the point I would be arguing is, is that around these slits, the electrons are spaced, um, but they're, they're held in a, a, a magnetic grid. They, 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 they always will find a tension between each other and be equidistant from each other in the sense that they all are force communicating. So they're basically saying, yeah, you're far enough away, yeah, you're far enough away, and so if it gets, if they're closer to one than they are the other, they would end up balancing between each other. So they're, they're always going to tend to line up um, comfortably at a certain distance, and they'll be uncomfortable distances. So when they're free, they're obviously at a very um, loose association. They're almost at the fringe of communicating with each other at all, of even feeling the force from each other, because they're basically free. They're under no tension, no compression. Um, so they're basically just saying, I'm content to be here. But if I move one, <clears throat> if I move, if I hit this electron in a Feynman kind of way, I put a, a photon comes in and gives it acceleration this way, then it gets closer to this one and both of these will become uncomfortable. But the real point is, is this one's going to communicate that extra momentum, eh, um, that velocity, that acceleration. And so this acceleration is going to be suppressed because this one's going to say, I don't want you getting closer to me. And so the field energy is going to create a pressure here. That pressure will be felt by this one, and he'll send the photon this way because that's his orientation to his neighbor. So his, his tendency to, to be force connected, his, his gyroscope is oriented in this direction, where this guy's gyroscope was oriented in this direction, if I could use that terminology. So depending on the force tension, the gyroscope, the, the place where they will admit the force vibration, is consistent with their alignment. And so for each one, that arrow, will be a different arrow of um, who their partner is. And it'll always be a specific degrees um, of separation. It tend to be. And that accounts for why you have a pattern that has a specific orientation to degrees that's connected to the amount of energy that went in. So depending on how much energy goes in, I mean, how, what frequency the um, light is that hits it will decide, in essence, how, um, you know, what, what this vector is. This, this angle of tension is going to be decided, um, see how to put that, um, by the frequency of the movement. So it's a the geometry, instead of the geometry being on the slit, the angle theta thing, it's really here. In terms of this angle is the angle that's going to be decided based on how aggressive the movement is. Because it's going to be moving in two directions, essentially. So if the force hits it straight, there's going to be that force plus the addition of the force in the sense that they have it has this, this um, bonding relationship. Um, so, <clears throat> the point is, is outside of this field line, this is the neutral line. So, meaning that if, if you took a neutral, a, 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 a charge, it would always leave perpendicular to this line, in the sense that the force is balanced on that line. And the 
this momentum is obviously not going to be balanced in the sense it's going to be off of that um, that balance line. So as soon as something the electron travels in this open field, then it's going to be feeling the pressure from the thing creating the field line to reorient itself back to the the field pressure. This pressure now will be stronger than the field. The field will push it back into the alignment, and that's what I'm saying is the energy of um, why the frequency is di di dictating how strong this angle is. So how strong the angle of the bonds between these things. So it really doesn't, nothing moves in the straight line. Everything moves in the, the vector line of a certain component in the x direction, a certain component in the, um, the y direction, and then a certain component in the x direction, and a certain component in the y direction. So everything's moving this at least line internally. That's, that's the internal thing. So even though it looks from our perspective like it went this way, it really did this internally. And that's what I'm trying to get to. And this is what's going to be frequency dependent in the sense that this frequency here will dictate how far it travels this direction, which will decide how this line and this line and this, you can see how those lines are decided by how, um, how, much, you, how much you go into a field will decide how the field will be stronger pushing you back. So it'll always end up being a staircase, but it'll just be bigger stairs as the frequency in increases. Yeah, it's probably a better probably a better way of saying that. Um, but there's not a one-to-one -one relationship, which means that's what accounts for the fact that there's a different, like red light will create a, a, a bigger angle, blue light a smaller angle. Um, <clears throat> um, so what else did I want to bring up? Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so you can sort of see that the the difference between the single slit and the double slit, you could sort of account for it in the sense that you can sort of understand that if you took these, if you took just the stuff coming out this end, and you just said, okay, let's just count, let's not ex count accelerations that might happen here where it would deflect this way, because that's just going to make us, that's just going to confuse us. So let's just use these outgoing ones. And if you just thought of these as angles, you know, the field line producing angles, you could sort of get the idea that that's the filter right there. That's what's going to create this bar pattern, is these angles. And as you, you know, <clears throat> as you compress the, the slit, this will become these angles will become more eccentric. Okay, the field lines will have to, you know, compress, and so they become more, more bent, and so your your pattern is spread out more. <clears throat> and the further away these, the, the wider this opening, the more these angles relax, and so now the the angles get tighter and tighter. So the bar pattern gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you widen this because the field lines get more and more relaxed. So you end up with a tighter pattern. Um, and you can see in this, obviously in the double slit, because you have this single, you have this impediment in the middle, you're creating these extra field lines here. So now you have, you have angles going this way, like, like here, and angles going this way, like here. <laughs> okay, but you have these internal converging angles that cross each other and um, you know add to the pattern. So these are the two things creating the pattern. The, this, the two patterns being superimposed on each other are this pattern and this pattern. So these are the two. These are the two components. These these exterior are creating the bars. The interior is creating the bulges. Uh, the bulges. Or vice versa. I'll have to figure out which one is which. Uh, I'm just trying to think if I can think of which one is which intuitively off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Can I? Um, well, I, I can't do it right now. But I'm just saying one of these is creating... So, so the two-slit pattern looks something like this. Um, And then that 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 and then that 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 
and that, 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 that. So, so it gets it's big in the middle, smaller, and then smaller. So there's two patterns. There's this pattern. And then there's the bars inside of that. So that's what the double slit produces. So what I'm arguing is this interior thing is doing this part. And this outside part is doing this part. Kind of. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if I think that's, you know, maybe I'll just keep this brief into this point. Um, but I did want to sort of get to the, the point that when you move an electron, um, you know, this is something I haven't, this is a hard thing to illustrate, so I haven't figured out exactly how to illustrate yet. Um, so you got this idea that the, the components are going back and forth, and they're going back and forth at, based on the field pressure, so they do it irregularly. You know, before this one hits something, it goes a little further one time, it goes a little less another time. And then it's reflex, you know, when it hits something again, it can be a longer line, it can be a shorter line. So we just think of this as being one thing, bouncing back and forth. So it can bounce, it can have a long bounce or it can have a short bounce depending on the field energy um, that it hits. But the, over time, there will be a consistent, a consistent rule about where and when and how it's going to hit one of those, um, one of those force lines. And the fundamental rule is, is that if I start moving in a direction, that is, I add extra force going this way, then I'll end up going, so, so if I add more blueness, that means this thing hits something sooner than it would have, or it uses up that green arrow, and now there's no green arrow to hit this one, if you sort of understand. So if I add a new one, a new little blue in here, there's going to be an interaction now that's going to get used, and that inevitably the next arrow that would have come up is going to go deeper into the field. So it goes deeper this way. And that consumes a little bit of time, in a sense, um, which means that the field energy from the other side, okay, since this is consuming more time, it went deeper into the field. That's like a longer arrow. This, this had a little more time to get a little deeper. So now the field energy is incurred into the other side because this hasn't reversed yet. And so until it reverses to come back to hit this other green coming in, you see if it takes longer for it to do a reversal because it went deeper this way, now it's going to take longer for it to come back here to hit this one. So this green one gets to go further in before it gets hit. And then obviously it's getting hit here, which is a much higher location, like only halfway in. And so therefore when it reflects, it's going to end up here, it's going to end up going deeper into this again. So that's the nature of velocity. So the nature of velocity is really something like this. Okay, it's a, <laughs> that's what it, the effect is like. So it has a tendency to go more in the one direction because of the time change. So it did a little more time this way means that this, this time will be affecting your rebound time and your rebound time is what's going to keep pushing you forward continually so until you have an extra blue to get rid of that green then you can go back to being um, neutral in terms of where the up and down part you know won't the up and down won't be doing the inner direction thing and so once you understand that then you can sort of understand that if something starts, if an electron, you know, one of these things that just has all this back and forth stuff in it, if it starts to move in a direction, it's going to essentially, there's so, so there's stuff going this way, back and forth this way, and there's also stuff going back and forth this way. Okay, so the problem is, is that if this end starts to do this, going in this direction, the stuff going back and forth, all of a sudden, this is going to leave, and this isn't going to is going to is going to get it's no longer going to be part of the electron. It's going to get it's going to be ejected essentially because the center of gravity. If we just say this is the center of gravity, the center of gravity, center of gravity, center of gravity, the center of gravity has moved away, and now this is no longer going to be retained inside of the 
the thing, the school. So it's going to be detached. So it's still going to go back and forth a lot. <laughs> okay, it's still going to be kind of stuck in the same, in the same I'm polarized, I keep bouncing off. It's going to keep stewing back and forth. But it's going to be doing back and forth, not part of anything anymore. Um, well, that's probably not the right way to say it. It's going to do back and forth. There's... It's going to do back and forth, but it's going to do it in the field. And obviously in the field, it's going to reflect off other things. And those other things are going to end up going this way and or that way depending on which way it was released so it's wrong to say back and forth because it's obviously when at the point of release it's only going to be going one way so technically there won't be any back and forth anymore and when it goes that one way it will hit other bits and reverse their direction so a bit will come in and get reversed and that's the nature of the field energy produced by the emf produced um, when electrons um, are accelerated. So when the electron gains in balance, so when it goes from this to this, at that moment it will lose stuff going this way. And so a piece of stuff going that way will be released into the field again. Yeah. So I just have to get the polarization part of that correct. So, so the real catch is to understand this is there's a, a, a mechanism I haven't discovered yet entirely um, whereby um, a specific polarization is held in an electron and a specific polarization which will be the red but I don't have a red marker at this moment so we'll just use green because that's what I have or black, we can use black so the electron will be blue, the proton hmm, black is running out would be the black and um, these polarizations being being the same polarization means that if you admit one of your blues uh, because you accelerated and a blue came out this way what that means is is that anything another blue guy over here this blue will end up being absorbed as part of its identity and now it will do this thing it'll do this it's it'll jerk its way in this forward direction. Um, and so it looks like it's repulsed, but it's not really repelled. It's just accepting your gift of velocity, your gift of acceleration. And now it's accelerating away this way. And in doing so, produces a force this way. So that's the trick part. So the force that caused the initial problem was this way. The, the, this created a freedom this way and then this one will create a freedom either that way or this way so it, it always balances out in the end the equal but opposite reaction ends up being this arrow to this arrow um, but it took a couple of interactions to get that arrow uh, something like that. Uh, so anyway yeah, I don't want to get too I think I got something basic here for you to feed on um, but again, I, the, so the Huygens argument, though, again, I, you know, if Hothaday wants to point me to a video where um, they use Huygens in the double slit experiment or the three slit experiment or some other experiment besides single apertures and uh, explain how the principle is used in any other circumstance besides to convert uh, single slits into something capable of producing two photons, because that's all it exists for. The whole point of Huygens and the waves is to create an excuse to create two end points and make the end points now individual photons. So that's all Huygens is for. They, they negate the entire, all the little infinite number of wavelets. They mathematically extract all of them except for the end ones. And now they have two photons. And that's all it's used for is to contrive two photons in the single slit experiment where you don't have an obvious source of two photons. And again, if you're going to use Huygens here, you have to, if you're going to call it a principle, you have to use it here and here. So how come this Huygens, this doesn't Huygens? There's no reason why this should Huygens and this shouldn't and this shouldn't.
there's no continuity or logical reason to say, no, Huygens just doesn't happen there. There's no explanation how the two-slit experiment knows not to Huygens. Okay, that's probably the best way to say it. But I have already said it, so. I don't know how to say it any clearer. Show me, okay? I mean, I'll show you. I can give you a link to the, I already did the Japanese woman doing the math. And clearly the single slit um, math only works with Huygens. And clearly the double slit math really describes the pattern you see in the single slit. In the sense that the math describes a consistent um, amount of bars. A consistent distance from each other. And it doesn't account for this double pattern at all. Truth. Okay, so I think that's enough. I uh, hopefully you've followed some of that. But I'm just saying it, it, this is this is good. This stuff is this is this is I think this is this is pretty close to how it's gonna turn out, but this is how it sort of is. So I've got, I'm gotten really close. Really close now. Anyway, till next time.